Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Sailing the East podcast. I'm Bala Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Hey, this is our podcast about sailing the East Coast of the United States. In some episodes, we'll focus on passages and destinations, and in other episodes, we'll talk about boats, equipment, and techniques. And once in a while, when we come across an interesting individual, we'll try to get them as a guest on the show. Now, what makes this podcast unique is that only one of us sails. Yeah, that would be me, Bela. I've been sailing for over 30 years, not across oceans, but on lakes and coastal cruising on the east coast of the United States. And I, Mike, know very little about sailing, so I'm going to ask most of the questions and Bela will try to answer. Mike, as a reminder, on our last episode, we discussed buying a sailboat because you were interested in kind of learning more about that. So uh, what are your thoughts now after that uh, conversation? So, Bela, you gave me a ton to think about in that last episode. And I'm thinking, you know, for kind of a newbie, starting with something more flexible makes a lot more sense where I don't have to commit um, commit so much to, to this kind of to, to this hobby. Uh, and I'm thinking that I've seen boats, I've seen cars pulling sailboats on trailers. Okay, dropping them off, putting them in the water, and then leaving at the end of the day, kind of thing. And you, to, to me, that seemed like an interesting idea. You've got some flexibility in where you can go. It's not so big. You don't have to deal with the slip and the marina all the time and things like that. So I'm kind of interested to talk about the possibility of trailerable boats. Hey, Mike, this is a great option. And I'll tell you, our first boat was a trailerable boat. It was a Catalina 22 that was built uh, in the late 80s. Now, Catalina 22s, I think their very first one was built in 1969. And they have made over 20,000 of those boats. So it's a big volume boat, meaning there's a lot of them made. And the good thing about that is you can pick up one that's 20, 25, 30 years old for somewhere between five to ten thousand dollars, so with the trailer, so that's that's pretty low cost when it comes to you know sailing. Now you can buy smaller sailboats that you can trailer, and we'll talk about those as well. But I just want to focus on sort of this category because this is when I had a family. My my two sons were young lads, uh, you know, teens and preteens, and my wife and I and all four of us would stay on the boat. So there was uh, places for four people to sleep. There was a little alcohol stove, a little porta potty, a dining room table, and a nice cockpit, you know. And we would take this predominantly on lakes is where we kept it. So it was a great, great way to sort of get out for a weekend, get out for a day, and do a little bit of sailing. If you wanted to sleep on it overnight, <clears throat> you could do that, and you could kind of explore that whole experience. And if you don't want to, that's okay too. So I think trailerable boats are are really really a good way to get started um they're relatively low cost there's some trailable boats you can buy for you know a thousand dollars you can get a sunfish uh which is a sort of a, a small it's like a big surfboard with a sail on it is one way to sort of think about it and you're going to get wet when you're sailing uh, so it's sort of a warm weather experience but you can buy those for less than a thousand dollars uh, when you get to be have a like a Catalina 22, and there's many manufacturers who made these boats. So there was this big surge in sailing in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s. That was sort of the heyday of sailing. So there's Catalina made a 22, O'Day made a 22, Tanzer made a 22. So there's a lot of these boats floating around. So you have a lot to lot to choose from, and. Uh, so that you can stay dry on, right? So you can, mm -hmm. on, a, on a Catalina 22, you don't have to get wet when you're sailing. And that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of important for me, Bela. So it's good. So I'm barking up the right tree. That's good news. Yeah. Kind of, what do I need to look for and focus on? What questions should I be asking? So I think a couple things you got to think about. One is, uh, you know, I, I, I know some people who have bought, you can buy boats bigger than, 25 foot so trailable boats you sort of max out close to 30 feet once you get bigger than 30 feet for a sailboat it, it you start getting too wide and too tall and you need special permits to pull it so uh catalina also makes like a 25 foot boat that you can trailer i think hunter makes one for tw a 25 foot or so 25 is probably for most people sort of the maximum length 
The challenge is when you start getting up above, when you start getting into the 25 foot, you're going to need a pickup truck to pull it. (laughs) So Mm. part of this, you know, sort of revolves around what vehicle you have. So I had a basically a, a Toyota 4Runner, which is a pickup truck, uh, but, but it's really a sedan uh, or, uh, or an SUV, and I towed that with my boat no problem. So you need something to tow these bigger boats because I think the Catalina 22 weighed about 4,000 pounds, if I remember correctly, and I think the trailer was another almost 1,000, so it's about 5,000-pound payload. So that's one thing you got to think about is how big a vehicle do you have And what's the towing capacity of the vehicle? Because if you buy a sailboat and then you have to buy a vehicle to tow it, it starts becoming a little more expensive. Uh, Whereas a sunfish, you can tow with your car, right? There are other sailboats. Again, you're going to get a little wet uh, that have, you know, regular hulls, not just a surfboard uh, like a sunfish. Uh, But those you can tow with a regular car. So I think you start... 25 feet is about the maximum length. So that's that's sort of one thing you got to think about is can I tow it? Do I have the ability to tow it? Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of one, one piece of it. Um, what about I the think, keel? What about yeah. the keel? I know the keel is a big deal. That's a rhyme, yeah. and I did that on purpose. But <laughs> Yes, so so there's, uh, there's a very popular boat called the J22 which people race on so it's a it's a racing sailboat and there's and there's national championships in J22 class and and being a racing boat they have a really deep keel so these trailers are kind of special and they're sort of a pain uh, most of your trailerable boats like our Catalina 22 a Hunter 22 or a 25 have what are called swing keels so the keel, you can raise it. There's a little uh, ratchet and a rope that you can raise the keel up. So the, when it sits on the trailer, the boat sits low to the ground, right? Which is how you want it if you're trailering something. Uh, so they all typically have swing keels or a very long but shallow keel. So the boat doesn't sit high on the trailer and it's not tippy. The J-22s, again, it's a racing boat, very special purpose. They sit really high on a trailer. And, and you know, they're even harder to get onto the trailer because the water needs to be really deep. The other good thing about a swing keel or a very shallow draft keel is you can go into shallower water. So there's actually some advantages there, right? Because many boat ramps, which is where you're going to launch this boat thing, you're going to take this to a boat ramp at a lake or a, 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 the, the ocean or a river, big wide river, and, you know, so the water needs to be certain depth. So a swing keel or a shallow draft keel is really important here. So you put it in the water, right? And then you yeah. drop that keel, right? Once That's right. In the water before you take off. And the same That's opposite right. coming in, right? You get to close to the, to the boat ramp, you winch up the keel, and then you can pull it right onto the trailer off the launch. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yep. 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 Okay, now that, that takes care of the that takes care of the bottom half. What about the top half? I mean, right? You got the mast. Oh, what what happens there? Yeah, so this part's uh, 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 can be more of a challenge. So on our Catalina twenty two, um, it had a you know big aluminum mast, and you got to take the mast down to trailer it because you can't fit under bridges, right? There's a maximum height that you have on roads. Right. So you got to Or drive throughs drive throughs <laughs> drive-in banks, all of these things. That's right. right? That could be a horrible, uh, you know, nightmare. Right. There, right. If you so forget a, you're going to the drive through to go to your Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and you got to, uh, uh, the mass sticking up. That's right. So you got to take the mass down. And uh, I think uh, with our boat, with my two sons, uh, you know, young teenagers, uh, between the three of us, we could get the mast up or down and fully configured and rigged in about an hour. So okay. from the, the time that we would pull into the parking lot at the lake to the time sort of the boat had the mast on it, ready to go, uh, was an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Now, the first time we did it, I think it took us a half a day, <laughs> right? But we got better at it and we learned. Um, so that's another thing. So again, the bigger the boat gets, the more, more complicated, the heavier the mast is. Uh, the more challenging this becomes. 
uh, on smaller boats, you know, the mast is on a sunfish, the mast is lined up. You just pick one person can pick it up. It's 15 minutes to get the boat ready. Right. Mm -hmm. So typically as the boat gets bigger, this process takes longer, which means if you're going to keep it in your backyard, going out for a day, you know, you got to drive to the lake. It's an hour, hour and a half to get ready before you get in the water. And then at the end of the day, you got to come out, you got to take the mask down. Again, it's an hour, an hour and a half to get ready and drive home. So this is another thing you got to think about. You got to think about where you're going to use it because that's that. And, and the bigger the boat, the more limited places you have to use it, right? The lakes need to get a little bit bigger. <laughs> like where I live, there's a very nice lake. It's great for boats under 20 feet. And you start getting bigger than that, the, the lakes, it's just too, the boats are too big, right? Then there's another lake where you can have a 30 or 40 foot boat. Not, not, you're not going to trailer those, but you know, you can have a much bigger boat. So uh, you got to think about where you're going to use it. You know, we talked about this in buying a boat too. You got to think about where you're going to use it and how you want to use it. So yeah, our boat. If you're, going, if you're going overnight for a night or two, then that's easier because you're not doing the takedown and setup twice in one day, right? You do the setup on, on Friday and you do the takedown on Sunday if you're spending two nights on the, on the boat, right? That's right. That's right. And then, and then it's worth it, right? Then the overhead of, of sort of getting there and getting ready and leaving makes, makes a lot of sense, right? <clears throat> Interesting. Well, okay. So we've got the bottom part and the top part. So I'm kind of envisioning what this looks like. Now, if I want to have a trailerable boat, but I, which I don't have, a big driveway or a garage, what are my options for parking this thing? Uh, well, here again, uh, there's lots of options. One of them is uh, we have these storage facilities here or, or around the United States. They're popping up all over the place. And, and many of them uh, have a, basically a parking lot where you can keep your boat. And it's locked. You know, the parking lot has a lock, has access to it. And you can rent a parking spot there to keep your boat. I used to do that um, and, and one of the places we lived when we had the Catalina. And uh, just just keep the boat there, and it's pretty low cost, doesn't cost very much. And then you go pick it up when you want to use it and drop it back off. So that's sort of one option. So and there's I would some imagine other if, if you've got a place that's on the way to the lake that you usually take it, it really doesn't even add much time, right, to the whole that, operation, right? You drive your forerunner right. or whatever there, you latch it, latch it onto the to the uh, um, to the trailer hitch, and off you go. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. So that's. You know, that's good planning if you do it that way, as opposed to, you know, finding a place to park it in the opposite direction of where you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, when we lived in California, uh, we kept the boat at a marina. But what we did there was uh, dry sailed it. And what I mean by that, and a lot of marinas, a lot of marinas will have storage space on land and it's pretty darn cheap. So we would keep the boat there. The mast would be on, up. So we leave everything up and rigged and we would just go there with the car, hook the car up to the trailer, pull the boat down to the ramp, launch it. Right. And then like we're ready to go. Yards, right? like, so yeah, like, like 100, 100 yards. Right. Like 100 yards. Away. Right. Okay. right. It's just, this is cool. And, so this, that works really well and it's quick and easy. Right. So it's 15 minutes. And then at the end of the day or when we're done sailing, we put the boat back on the trailer, take it to its parking spot, unhook it from the car and we're done. And, and so that works really well also. And then uh, if you, so, if you want to take a longer trip, then you take the mask down and you crank, right, you crank button everything up and then you can drive away and right and go somewhere. That's right. So that's one of the beauties of, of a sailboat. It lets you explore. And right. This, and this is called dry sailing. Is that what you called this? Yes. Or dry, dry storage, right? Dry storage. Dry, dry, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the beauties of a trailable boat is you, if you like to explore different bodies of water, you can do them and, you're doing it at 60 miles an hour to get there as opposed to in my boat, I'm getting there at, you know, five miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So, so it gives you a lot of access. And again, depending upon where you live, uh, you have lots of options. And, and so trailable boats are, I think a really good option. Uh, another option is there are sailing clubs. Uh, lots of lakes have sailing clubs uh, where I live. Every lake has at least one sailing club. And oftentimes these sailing clubs will have a place that you can store a boat, uh, meaning a place you can park the boat. 
And then again, uh, you know, you join the club, you pay a little bit of money and, and you can, and they have a ramp and you can launch your boat and when you're sailing and take it out and store it there for, for the, the season. And so that's another great option. If you don't have space in your own house, uh, there was a period of time when we had the Catalina at, at one of the places we lived, we kept it in the backyard because we could. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we took it, uh, and, uh, it was really easy. Uh, and so there are storage options. Again, think about how you're going to use it, where you're going to use it. And I think that helps sort of you define the size of boat you want, where you want to store it, how you want to store it, uh, and what's really uh, convenient for you. Yeah, this is cool, Bela. This, I, I'm really intrigued by this, and it seems like talking through my needs and, the, and kind of the benefits of this are good. But let's go through what the downsides are. Seems kind of too good to be true from, from my standpoint, that this might be the perfect situation, but I know there's no such thing as perfect. Yeah, so besides putting the mast up and down, you know, which is which sort of limits again how depending on how big it is, whether you can take it out for a day or not. But there's alternatives around that. Uh, I think another potential downside is you're trailering something, and some people don't like to drive a car pulling a trailer behind it. Right? It takes a little bit of skill, a little bit of practice. Uh, going forward is a lot easier than backing the trailer up. <laughs> so. You know, that takes a little bit of skill. So when you get to the place you're going to launch the boat, typically you can't drive forward to launch the boat. You have to back down the boat ramp into the water. So you have to learn that skill. Uh, Again, it's all learnable, uh, but that's sort of a a bit of a downside. Um, You know, and and you're pulling the boat behind a car. Uh, Stones get thrown up, uh, can damage, you know, put a little chips in your, in your, uh, in your hull or whatever. Uh, there's sort of that piece to it. Um, and I think it, it's just sort of a different way of sort of thinking about and, and sailing, right? It sort of, again, depends on your mindset. If I think they're, again, they're great. If you want to explore, if you want to sail lots and you just want to be able to, you know, after work, go down to the marina, hop on your boat, go out, sail for an hour and come back. This is probably this not, work. this doesn't work, right? Because the overhead time is a little, a little higher, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the balance you got to figure out. And, and for us, it worked very well. And it was a great way to sort of get introduced to sailing, right? So it wasn't a big investment. I think when we bought our boat, we bought it in the... Uh, late eighties, early nineties, excuse me. Yeah. And, um, uh, we, I think we paid like $8,000 for it and I sold it 25 years later for, I think 7,000. Right. So that nice. wasn't bad. Yeah. And, and it was a great way for us to sort of get into sailing as a family and experience that and then say, yeah, this is something we like or it's something we don't like. And it wasn't a huge commitment, right? Because you buy a big boat, a big 30 or 40 foot boat, you know, you're, you're taking a big step off the dock, <laughs> so to speak, uh, and making a big commitment. This is a way to ease into it. And, and most of these uh, trailerable boats, uh, there's a good market for them, right? You, you, you can, since they're not a lot of money, there's a lot of buying and selling that goes on, right? It, it's easy to, to sell it if you say, yeah, this isn't for me. Yeah, and right. I would imagine since there's a lot of these made, right? If you get one of these 22-foot Catalinas, there's a bunch of them. So parts is no problem. Finding a mechanic to work on them is no problem, right? It's like anything. Uh, the more units in service you have, the easier it is to, to do maintenance and find people to help you take care of it. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bela. This was really helpful, and it really enlightened me quite a bit. So I appreciate you taking the time to put it together. What do you think? Should we wrap it up? Sounds good to me, Mike. All right, listeners, thanks for joining us. We hope you found this episode interesting and thought-provoking, whether you're a newbie like me or a veteran like Bela. Uh, but if you do have questions about what we've discussed, please do get in touch with us. Our email is sailingtheeast, all one word, at gmail.com. And please do subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. And even better yet, tell a friend. Maybe get them to listen as too. So until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you soon, Mike. Thanks, Bela, from over here in Munster, Germany. I'll see you next time.